Welcome, distinguished guests, lawmakers, parliamentary staff, and taxpayers with real jobs to the most anticipated ceremony of the season, the fourth annual Jonesy Awards honoring the best of the worst in government waste, greed, graft, fraud, and flagrancy. For the first time, we're presenting in the heart of the beehive, this house of hogs, this prestigious pig parlor, this Reichstag of rapacious revenue grabs, and in the banquet hall, no less, which is appropriate because tonight we dine. We dine on a pantheon of pork. We put greed on the griddle. We binge on the bacon. My name is Louis Holbrook, and along with researcher Annabelle Fleming and rescued from a Wuhan wet market, Porky the Waste Hater, we are your hosts. Our academy of experts have been led by the science. They have whittled through more than 500 nominations through an, infallibus, an infallible process to select the most scandalous cases of waste in the local and central government sectors. From this podium of truth, one golden pig will be awarded for waste at the local level. Another will be awarded for waste from here within the beehive. And finally, the most infamous animal this corker of a porker will be awarded to our lifetime achiever in government waste. So, Annabelle, why don't you step up to the lectern of largesse and tell us who's on the platter in the local government category? Well, Louis, it's a truly glittering lineup. But first, an honourable mention to Christchurch City Council, who didn't quite make the cut as an official nomination, but wowed our judges with their concrete diving board to nowhere. <laughs> this three metre, $45,000 installation was delayed by two years because the council couldn't get permission from the council to get it installed. But it now stands proudly within sight of water, just not quite close enough to actually jump from. If only they hadn't fired the city's ratepayer-funded wizard, he could have magicked up a swimming pool. The artist responsible for the diving board proudly explained that it is a surreal, redundant, and inaccessible object. We couldn't agree more. <laughs> now, our first official nomination in the local government category is Auckland Council for its dots and roadblocks. When Auckland Council received a cash injection from Wellington to innovate its streets, they chose to ignore the lessons of Dunedin's disastrous dot painting campaign and rapidly set out to revolutionise waste and inconvenience for Auckland ratepayers. In Henderson, $850,000 was spent to paint an intersection blue and block off lanes with planter boxes, leading to hundreds of locals protesting in the streets over the increased congestion and collapsing business revenue. $192,000 was spent on blue paint alone. In Takapuna, an advocacy group for the blind pointed out that $100,000 spent on coloured dots could lead to disorientation and injury. Meanwhile, in Onehunga, $41,000 was spent blocking a road with plywood crates, which were promptly vandalised by locals with messages of road for cars, we don't want, and move these please Phil. <laughs> when Phil didn't show up, an irate local with a forklift took matters into his own hands. <laughs> The council really did bring the community together. Our second nomination is Hamilton City Council for turning governance into child's play. While planning an 8.9% rate hike, Hamilton City Council decided that what ratepayers really needed was a sense of fun. So, with a grant from Sport New Zealand, they hired the president of the New Zealand Parkour Association, one Dr. Damien Puddle, as the city's official play advocate. Here's a video he posted of himself getting around the office. This is what your rates are paying for. Anyway, Dr. Puddle quickly set to work on the important business of pulling together the city's 10 highly paid councillors and 41 of their staff for an urgent series of workshops in which he tasked them with making ducks out of Lego. We thought that sounded quackers, 
So we used an official information request to obtain a photo of the 10 ducks made by Hamilton City Councillors. As you can see, they can't even get their ducks in a row. Of course, Hamilton City Council have form for soliciting dodgy advice. The council was caught sending staff into classrooms to harvest submissions from school children on its iwi partnership strategy and then boasting about the high levels of youth engagement. The council is also currently considering spending $10 million on an artificial lagoon resort. At least they'll have somewhere to play with their ducks. Third in the local government category is Nelson City Council for spending $800,000 on a toilet block twice. Nelson City Council narrowly missed out on a Jonesy nomination back in 2019 when they built a set of public toilets for $455,000. We would say that was flushing money down the toilet, but unfortunately the toilet stopped flushing after two weeks and required repairs. The council clearly decided to up their game for this year's awards. Flush with half a million dollars from the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment's Toilet Fund, which is apparently a thing, they unveiled not one, but two new architecturally designed toilet blocks costing 800 grand each. As you can see, one appears to be made from shipping containers and the other looks like a prison which frankly is exactly how we like our public toilets here at the Taxpayers' Union, but we don't see why they had to cost 350 years worth of a typical Nelson rates bill. Fourth up, we have Tauranga Commission Chair Anne Tolley for her fix it fail. Anne Tolley was appointed to fix problems at Tauranga City Council, effectively replacing the mayor and councillors with her merry band of unelected commissioners. After just eight months on the job, Tauranga ratepayers have forked out $265,000 for Ms. Tolley's salary and personal expenses. That means she's paid more than a cabinet minister and more than our highest paid mayor, Phil Goff. It must be a big job, or perhaps not. Being commission chair is in fact a part-time role. She's paid $1,800 for every day she decides to show up to the office. So what have Tauranga ratepayers got to show for Ms. Tolley's troubleshooting? Well, she's hiked rates by 17%. Her restructure to achieve staffing efficiencies increased the council's spending on salaries by 12%. She blew out the budget for some bus and cycle lanes by 15, sorry, $13 million and sold a ratepayer-owned car park to a developer for $1. Truly transformational leadership. And our final local nominee is Rotorua Lakes Mayor Steve Chadwick for her army of executives. Something smells in Rotorua. Back in 2017, we gave Steve Chadwick's council a Supreme Achievement Award for creativity and government waste for importing $90,000 worth of mud from Korea for a mud festival. And last year, we nominated this 12 meter million dollar monstrosity of a sculpture for a local government Jonesy. But Mayor Chadwick is persistent. This year, she signed off on an organizational realignment, giving her chief executives some deputies, each paid upwards of $200,000. So how many deputy chief executives does Rotorua's council need? Apparently it's not one, not two, not three, but seven deputy chief executives. That's a lot of leadership. Sadly, not one of these deputy chief executives was able to prevent an $11 million budget blowout for the restoration of the town's local performing arts centre. Well, Annabelle, while each of these nominees is truly remarkable, only one can take home the golden ham. Porky? And the winner of the 2021 Jonesy Award for Waste and Local Government is Tauranga Commission Chair Anne Tolley for her fix it failure. Fantastic, a really, really impressive showing from the local sector this year. But we must now brace ourselves for the shining achievements of central government. 
starry-eyed spending ideas dreamt up in these very hallowed halls. There's only space at the trough for five nominees. So first, let me give an honourable mention to NZ On Air, our major funder of homegrown television, which gave $2.6 million to a TV film that dredges up and dramatises the political affair we'd all rather forget. But with that out of the way, I can now present our first official nomination in the central government category for waste. To Papa and the Department of Conservation for their gross mistreatment of a dead turtle. Yes, our researchers this year uncovered a bizarre odyssey that saw a dead turtle travel by land, sea and air before finally being buried on a hilltop by public servants. Now, Heather Duplissy Allen ran through the full saga on Newstalk ZB, so I thought I'd let her do the talking. This is courtesy of the Taxpayers' Union, so thanks for this. It, it is unbelievable. In March 2019, a dead leatherback turtle was found on the shore in Banks Peninsula. Doc got in touch with Te Papa and said that the local Banks Peninsula mar marae there decided that Te Papa could have the turtle. So what Doc did was it got its ranger to use a tractor to pick up the turtle and put it on the back of his ute. And then they got a truck that belongs to a pet food company so that the turtle will remain chilled. And then they transported the, the turtle using that. The ranger's costs at this stage are simply his wages, which is $200. The turtle is collected by Te Papa from the Department of Conservation Office in Christchurch and then is driven up to Wellington in Te Papa's Toyota Hilux. This costs around about $500. The turtle arrives at Te Papa at the Tory Street facility where they're going to do a little bit of an autopsy, find out what's going on, you know, look at it for science. All of a sudden, up pops the local iwi, Ngai Tahu. The representative, Matsu Payne, tells the media they have changed their minds about this. They'd like to keep the turtle. They have a, quote, sense of grief and sadness that we didn't have the opportunity to grieve for our kaitiaki, for our tipuna. So as a result of that, there's a big discussion that's now happening between Te Papa and the Marae. What are we going to do with the turtle? Do you want the turtle back? The turtle spends 20 months, 21 months in Te Papa's freezer. No scientific research is taking place at this point. Now, remember, the cost of getting the turtle up to Te Papa at this stage is $700. All of a sudden, we're going to see the, balloon, the, the costs balloon, aren't we? So Te Papa staff build a crate for the turtle, a turtle coffin. That costs $600. On 11 December 2020, the staff are joined by a contingent from that marae for, a, for a, a karakia or a prayer in Wellington. Doc then transports the turtle from Wellington back to Banks Peninsula in a refrigerated truck. The three-day journey includes reported costs of about $1,000 in mileage, about $500 for the Cook Strait Ferry Crossing and about a $500 cost in wages. Eight Te Papa staff, including members of the board, yes, the board of Te Papa, the board and the senior leadership team fly to Canterbury for a porphyry for the turtle. The domestic travel, the car rental and the accommodation is more than $4,000. The porphyry and the kai for 40 people is almost $900. At the porphyry, the eight Te Papa staff are joined by seven dock staff. Four of the dock staff are paid by the hour. That's a total cost of $600. Dock pays a $200 koha to the marae. Doc spends $130 on um, the mileage. The turtle arrives at its own porphyry, is removed from its coffin, is placed on an altar to thaw while speeches are given and eventually strapped to a crate and flown via helico helicopter. Crane was okay last time round, now we've got a helicopter. The helicopter to its burial site, a hilltop on a nearby island. Doc pays $1,600 for the helicopter service. Reported wage costs for these activities are $900. To Papa and Doc's total reported expenses were nearly $12,000 and that excludes the time cost for high-level salaried staff. To Papa's board, eh? What's, the funeral industry what's is often overpriced, isn't it, Heather? I mean, I know they've isn't got to make a living and everything, but, you know, you, you never just put anyone on the ground uh, anymore. I just, I don't really know what to say. Frankly, I don't know what else to say either. So on to our second nomination the Right Honourable Trevor Mallard for dragging taxpayers through the muck. Now, this nomination is less of a laughing matter. Uh, taxpayers were made to foot the bill for $333,000 in legal fees and settlement costs because our Speaker of the House falsely accused a parliamentary, service, uh, parliamentary staffer of a serious crime. Now, when that individual who was falsely accused initiated defamation action, 
Mallard threatened to defend himself on the basis that he was telling the truth. However, he later admitted that he knew he was wrong within 24 hours of making that initial accusation. So why did he not retract there and then? Now, to be honest, we were a little bit unsure about whether we'd include this nomination, firstly because of the serious and the, uh, sordid, nomina uh, the sordid nature of the allegation, uh, but also because as Speaker of the House, it's actually up to Tre Trevor Mallard uh, to allow us to host these prestigious awards here at Parliament on his turf. In fact, we were told by the Speaker's office that he was concerned about our booking this year uh, because of some kind of stunt we'd performed at a select committee meeting last year? Uh, I wonder what he could be referring to. But needless to say, the Right Honourable Trevor Mallard is yet to pay his invoice to taxpayers. Our third nomination in the central government category is the Honourable Phil Twyford and the Honourable Michael Wood for the $785 million bike bridge. Yes, when Aucklanders first heard the word sky path, it was meant to be a dinky little privately funded clip-on to the Harbour Bridge that wouldn't cost taxpayers a cent. But then the politicians got involved. Phil Twyford decided to uh, take this project under the loving wing of central government for a modest budget of $67 million, which then became $360 million, until it was discovered that the bridge was at risk of falling down with the weight of yet another clip-on. Uh, but this did not stop our new Transport Minister, Michael Wood. No, Michael Wood took the project to the next level, a gleaming, gold-plated, $785 million standalone bike bridge exclusively for the suffering day walkers and cyclists of Takapuna and Westhaven. When polling revealed that even Labour voters thought this was a stupid idea, the idea was scrapped. But $51 million has already been burnt on paperwork without a shovel touching ground. In fact, even now, taxpayers are haunted by the ghost of Michael Wood's bike bridge, with the transport agency still paying for engineering reports and sketches that it hopes might come in handy one day. Uh, we sure hope not. And our fourth nomination for waste from the Beehive is the Honourable Jacinda Ardern. Yes, this year the Prime Minister, along with the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Justice, signed off on funding for a meth rehab program in the Hawke's Bay. But this is a special rehab program. It's run by members of a little known local outfit. Uh, I, I, had to call them, I had to look them up. Uh, you might have heard of them, but it turns out they're well known for selling meth in the Hawke's Bay. And now they're running the rehab too. So we have to admit, it's an excellent display of vertical integration, a structural business innovation that even the Commerce Commission had never conceived of. For some reason, the local police weren't too impressed at that innovation, but uh, more eyebrows were raised when a video emerged of the program's patched leader telling gang members to vote for Labour. But fear not, Harry Tam fronted up in a TV interview and explained, Jacinda trusts me, why don't you? Well, there's a guy who knows where his bread is buttered. And finally, put your lighters in the air for our final central government nominee. Tourism NZ for its Rod Stewart sing-along. Yes, the tourism agency spent almost a million dollars to have Rod Stewart sing his hit song, Sailing, for the America's Cup. But to the great disappointment of a certain demographic, uh, Sir Rod did not appear in person. In fact, he didn't even cross live via satellite. No, uh, the lip-synced performance was recorded at an undisclosed date on a barge in London and stitched together with a video chat between Sir Rod and Clark Gayford, who happens to be a real favourite in the Taxpayers' Union Facebook comment section. Tourism NZ even decided to leave in the part where Clark and the British pop star uh, bonded over their famous partners and Sir Rob even gushed over the Prime Minister's gorgeous smile. We understand that uh, this is the reason for the large amounts of vomit left on the Auckland waterfront after the event. That's a grand group of gravy guzzlers in the central government category, but only one can take home the primrose pig. Porky? 
And so, the winner of the Jonesy Award for Waste in Central Government is to Papa and Doc for the abuse of a departed turtle. Okay, we now come to the climax of these ceremonies, the most heinous hog, the horrible ham, the big pig, marking lifetime achievement in government waste. Our winner today cut their political teeth in the high stakes power plays of student politics and proved their intellectual mettle by writing a dissertation about student politics. This immediately qualified them for a career in the public sector, working at the Foreign Ministry and the United Nations before coming home to serve as an advisor to Helen Clark. Without even a whiff of the private sector about him, Grant Murray Robertson was perfectly qualified in 2008 to win the seat of Wellington Central and in 2017 to become a Labour Party finance minister. For his first two years in charge of the fiscal strings, Grant Robertson was almost a paragon of fiscal responsibility, studiously abiding by fiscal targets set by Serbal English and winding down debt and declining to introduce new taxes. But that all went out the window when a bat and a bird got too friendly in China and the spending floodgates opened. The $12 billion COVID-19 response and recovery fund was quickly topped up by another $50 billion. And when you're working with that much money, who's gonna miss a few million wasted here or a few billion wasted there? Louis, why don't you run us through just a few of the examples of COVID response spending born from the minister's fund? Okay, um, prepare yourselves. Remember, this is all about fighting COVID-19. You ready, Porky? $12 million for flood protection in the far north, $26 million for cameras on fishing boats, $50 million for regional digital connectivity, $52 million for the horse racing industry, $55 million for public interest journalism, $100 million for affordable housing projects, $87 million on internet modems for school kids, including Mike Hoskins' kid, $200 million on a new building for the University of Auckland, $155 million for transformative energy projects, $210 million for climate resilience projects, $374 million in arts grants, including $17 million for art therapy programs, $515 million for school lunches, $761 million to support three waters reform, and $1.2 billion for jobs for nature. In the end, only about a quarter of the $62 billion COVID response fund was spent on the wage subsidies that we at the Taxpayers' Union so dearly support. Eventually, the unthinkable happened, something that surely not a single health expert could have predicted. New Zealand got a second COVID outbreak and the tank was empty. But before his colleagues had a chance to ask him exactly where all the money went, Grant Robertson announced good news. He's topped it up by another seven billion, fresh off the Reserve Bank printing press. Problem solved. And somewhere along the line, Grant Robertson's no new taxes promise was jettisoned too, with new taxes on housing investments and a new 39% tax rate for high earners. Anyone who's looked at Shane Jones's hotel receipts will know it's hard to make that man blush. But the sheer extent of pork barrelling to emerge from Grant Robertson's COVID response fund puts the infamous Provincial Growth Fund to shame. And we named these awards after Shane Jones in honour of that little piggy bank. So we are obligated today as an act of integrity and utmost respect towards Shane Jones to welcome a new member into the pantheon of pork barrel spenders. The winner, oh, Porky, thank you. The winner of the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award for Excellence in Government Waste is Finance Minister Grant Robertson for making Shane Jones look like a symbol of lean and efficient government. Well, Grant was going to accept his award in person, but Bellamy's is serving pork chops today. Uh, but he's, he's just up there, so I think he heard you. Now, to close today's proceedings, uh, I'd like to thank you, the humble taxpayers and ratepayers of this country, for forking out to make all of this wanton waste possible. Now, we have fun at the Joneses, uh, but there is a serious message. All of this spending is your money. It's your time, and it's your sweat. So this ceremony serves as a warning to the malevolent 
money wasters in Parliament and in town halls across the country. You need to rein it in unless you want a golden sow of your own to mark your abuse of productive New Zealanders. Annabelle, Porky and I uh, will take some brief photographs, uh, but thank you for coming. And so long as one politician somewhere out there wastes just one dollar of your money, we'll see you next year.